Well, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm, uh, I'm the, in the Faculty of Forestry at the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences. I actually used to be in the Fishery Center a long time ago, with a sordid past, and then I left, but I'm still affiliated, so I haven't really left. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about work that my group has been uh, doing now for about the past 15 years, I'm sort of trying to bring it all together here, and I entitled my presentation, Touching Salmon, When Is It Wrong? And it's not as uh, silly a title as you might think, because it has all to do with the consequences of release or escape from fisheries capture. Species of Pacific salmon that we harvest, these, these are all fine, you should know them probably. 
um, they range from the biggest and generally the oldest pinup uh, down to the youngest and smallest pink salmon. They all have different ways that we harvest them, but we catch them all in our fisheries locally. And just to sort of work you through some data here, it's a bit of a busy figure, but I wanted to highlight uh, that we have kind of touched pink a lot in the past, and we're touching it a little bit less in recent years, but not a lot less. So if you look at the yellow and orange bars, the yellow and orange bars are the total catch in a given year. The blue bars are the amount of fish that escaped harvesting and made it to the river and hopefully the spawning grounds. The total type of the bar then is the run size for a given year. These are favorite stock values. You can see that the runs uh, were around 10 to 20 million typically in the early, earlier years of this slide. Uh, and there's a four year cycle that occurs that we're aware of in Fraser stock eye. In recent years, the off cycle abundance has gone down quite a bit. In terms of total harvest, the exploitation rate, which is the blue line here, and on the axis over here, exploitation rate in the early years of this slide ranged from you know, uh, over 50% in the recent years, about 20 to 50%. But in the most recent years, in particular 2016 and 2018, way up here at the slide side of the graph, we're looking at less than 2% harvest. And in fact, this current year, 2019, we had less than uh, 400,000 or 500,000 sockeye returns with a harvest rate of less than a third of a percent. So it's the recent years, we're not touching them very much, but there's still years, especially every fourth year, when we do uh, harvest uh, fraser sockeye quite a bit. This is just a good indicator of some of the trends that we see among a lot of the species. Although many species are suffering in terms of being threatened or endangered, we still are harvesting others and considering them all together. So why would we need to do care about any of this? Well, for, for most commercial and recreational fisheries, um, the fish is a cat. And there's been issues of the during the harvest process around the welfare, how you capture them, how you land them, how you kill them humanely, the issues of fisheries collapsing over harvest, all important issues, but these are things that, that we're not going to be focusing on. Instead, what I'm going to focus on is what happens to them if they get released or escape from capture during this process of harvest. So this is a phenomenon usually referred to as bycatch or discharge. The capture release of a non target species uh, or size of fish. Globally, bycatch can range up to 40% of the total commercial fish harvest. Um, and locally, we see that up to a third of recreational harvest of Fraser sockeye, for example, gets released in some years. We know that some years, large portions of some of the commercial harvest uh, of salmon in excess are non target fish and need to be released. And going even more important is endangered salmon are often captured in mixed stock fisheries, and they'll have to be released. Why do we release them? Well, for a variety of reasons, they're not the target species, they're a species of conservation concern, maybe they're too small, maybe uh, if it's a recreational fishery, there's a conservation ethic in the end. There's lots of different motivations and uh, regulatory reasons why we might need to release or want to release a fish. But what happens to a fish during this capture and release event? I'm going to walk you through some of the physiological issues that are involved. First of all, this fish exhibits strenuous exercise that usually involves maximum burst joint speed. And as a result of that, because they're invoking antibiosis or anaerobic metabolism, um, they're usually oxygen death that's building up in their tissues. Along with that oxygen death is the accumulation of stress metabolites like lactic acid, plasma lactate in this case. So on the figure, we're looking at plasma lactate associated with harvest and easy samples a series of different gear types. Um, we've done this work uh, in the lab and field and find that this level is, is generally a level associated with late mortality. So if you're coming in with lactic acid levels above this, there's a good chance you're not going to survive because of your acidosis. And you can see that there's lots of individuals that get harvested in some of these gear types that would meet that criteria that probably will not survive as a result of that mechanism if they were to be released. Another thing that goes on with fish when you're harvesting them. Um, and it happens to release them is they usually have issue with oxygen. And it can occur in one of two ways. The first is that they may get exposed to air. And if there's people in good air, you want to show people your fish, you want to take a picture of your fish, or you may need to get the fish out of the gear. All of this usually occurs in air. The other thing that happens is that oxygen as a result of crowding. So in a bag of pink salmon like this, oxygen levels can drop precipitously. And so, again, it's a similar problem when you're exposed to the atmosphere, the air, or you're getting the air from the oxygen sucked out of the water as a result of crowding. What happens is when you link the maximum exercise uh, with air exposure, you get sitting impairment. And the sitting impairment, as I'll show you, can vary quite a bit with external factors, but it looks like this. So this is a fish that we experimentally had exercise for three minutes, and then it's 
some guy that they can hold it on that they can tell that it is that cancer now. Body flex tool. If you hold a fish just out of the water, right side out, and have it on a flex, it's fine. Uh, head complex, and then probably your perpillar is moving now. Um, there's a similar active response to the eyes track you when you look it in the eyes. And then orientation is what Brad Brad is doing here, who is a former PhD in postdoc with me. Then you take that side down and look at right and stuff. All of these things are yes or no answer. You give them a point to each one. You add them all up, then you go from uh, a, a very unimpaired fish to zero to something that's very impaired at one. A very simple little metric that we use to move forward with assessing uh, the mechanisms and the causes, in some cases, of the case of other mortality. What we found was that like, looking at impairments for uh, probably really nicely with how long the fish was in the net. So this time in the same net. So this is how much long, how long the pebbles are in this net with the pink thing. If we see the longer in the net, the higher the impairment. So what we did then is we got uh, soft fish to put all the net, we assess them with grams, we put transmitters in them, and we talked to the same sorts of swimming grounds where we tracked this black guy a short time earlier. We were able to categorize the fish into three groups. Uh, groups that died uh, within the zone that was touching them, so after we tagged and released them, they were alive when we tagged them. We tagged them. Fish that died sometimes after they left our zone of tight tagging, and fish that made it to the spotty zone. What we found is that fish we can when time, the amount of time in the net uh, was related to this mortality value. So the longer you were in the net, the more likely you were to die at the site. And uh, if you were intermediate time in the net, you were either going to kill them at the site or you were going to die later. And if you were in the net the least amount of time, you would likely to make it to the body ground. So that accounts for also reflecting this. So time in net is the big issue. And what we figured with time in net is it had to do with oxygen. And so the oxygen levels in those nets was about a 4 milligrams per liter, which is really low. These fish need 12 milligrams per liter at least to be able to successfully migrate. The uh, longer they're being deprived of oxygen, the more impaired they're becoming, and the more work their hearts have to do, and in some cases is not able to recover even days later after pulling away from our site. It's a good time now to bring in another factor that the focus is all on, and that's temperature. We all know temperatures are rising. Uh, this is just a graph to show you this. This is uh, the maximum temperature of the lower Fraser River. They've been increasing over the past 65 years by about 2 degrees. Uh, we're expecting up to one and one and a half degree warming by uh, year 2050. So temperature is something that we need to look at, and we focused quite a bit on our, our work on in recent years. But what we began to do in the lab was to simulate a fishery and we overlay temperature effects on it. It's really hard to overlay temperature effects in the field that you can do that in the lab. And so these studies, and we did quite a few of them, involved having uh, all my grad students coming in over 10 or 2 days at a time, scaring fish around the tanks and making them swim in circles. Population in the Chilco, which didn't show this quite relationship. In fact, 
the lower weight of the back cell with increasing temperature. I won't put the body details why, but they seem to be there and to have adaptation in their heart ventricles to be able to move oxygen more efficiently uh, through their body. Rather than the other populations that were more prepared for a lot of part of the PhD to show that. Anyhow, the main point here is that generally, most populations, higher temperatures mean poor survival and often have a good release. So, one thing that was missing from all these experiments was the injury component, as I mentioned earlier. We were doing a lot of exercise and air exposure, but not a lot of injury. So, we started bringing injury to I'll show you, hopefully, this video clip where I'm. Let's see what we got going on here. So, this is our former grad student, now postdoc, showing how we would allow fish to get entangled into a gill net. Here. So this is what it looks like with a strong gill net. But we would do this for different populations depending on the study. I believe in this case it was a point second gill net entanglement. And so the fish is will sort of maximally on and off. And so while it's doing that, it is able to be the handling by our system building a carbon oxygen gas. But our main goal is the oxygen gas management put it in here. And we pulled it in here for a minute as you might expect when the fish is getting out of the gear um, or you're taking pictures with it. So that's the typical approach that we use for the for most of these studies. Uh, so this would be a sockeye cat that started a four-week migration to capture the little crazy river. They're bound for the early stewards. That's probably around a thousand kilometers away. We would hold them under a natural flow regime, as though they were transiting in the river that year. But we handle them, release them, because they are getting entangled. We see the one unit as a result of that entanglement. We expose them to air. And that would help them our lab up in the public lake to make sure we put them in the natural
the culture we have it, it's it's been called the whole. So we are interested in it more than just one level place to find out why do these two things work or not work. What are the circumstances that might uh might make this a better approach? So we did these things we call exhaustive simulation and resuscitation experiments. And they're really similar to the exhaustive bit from killing for three minutes. We expose them to air. And this particular study, uh, which was uh Kendra Robinson's master's work, uh, we also contrasted them under a cool and warm temperature and these fish that were not so frozen and on sort of the trial system. So three minute results of exercise were in the air. And then some were given some ventilation assistance. So this would be having a, a flow of speed water coming out of the tube here and you're just allowing the fish to land and ventilate themselves and out of the tube. And I'm sure all of you that are recreationally angled, you've heard that maybe people if you hold the fish on the flow, but maybe some people will be you know sort of leave the fish in a tough one fashion. All these things were analyzed and we're trying to develop what sort of a ventilation approach could we offer to these fish to see if we can help them. Here's some of the results. Um, first of all temperature pumped everything. It didn't matter what we did at 21 degrees, everybody got laid off for three days. Resuscitation was not necessary. At 16 degrees, so when we didn't assist them with ventilation, 80% of the females died and 10% of the males. Again, this is because females died of mortality. So now you're like, okay, please show us that you're ventilating to help these fish. And they did not. Um, we put the ventilation, made it work. All the females died. <laughs> Okay, so maybe this is a lab artifact. Okay, no benefit. Maybe this is a good field to see if we can make it better in the field. So those are two. We captured fish uh, here um, near Harrison Hot Springs. They were bound for this location. We captured them with a deep tank. Then we did the same thing with free and fly. Spray with outside air exposure, hit the ventilation, tag, soft. No sense of this. Control fish, the fish that we just tagged out of the deep tank and let them go. Saw lots of mortality in there, so about half the types of fish the same tagging on this one. We saw over half the females perish, and almost half the males perish. When we did the simulation with no assisted ventilation, all the females died, and almost all the males died. Same thing with assisted ventilation, it didn't help at all. So, the big problem from this, and we've been, we've been going to this for some time, is that touching makes things worse. So even our best efforts sometimes to resuscitate fish might actually be hindering their recovery, not helping them, because if they're able to swim away, we should be letting them swim away, forcing them to be held against their, their will, uh, even if the water flow is in the right direction, it's probably not a good thing. So to change gears just a little bit, fish test fit for fish in here. So sometimes they do this molecularly, they get it in here, they get out of here. There's going to be less issues with air exposure, but many more issues with injury. It's really just funny, but there was a documentary some years ago, maybe some of you saw this documentary, that talked about this, it was a really important one. I had my kids watch this. But Finding Nemo was a really important documentary that looked at the effects of getting out of the fish tank. You may remember this scene, maybe some of you are too young to remember this, you should go back and watch this. But you may remember Nemo going to dump a useless swim down and tell all the fish in the to swim down so they can break their way out of that net. And of course, the rest of the school was swimmed down, the beam broke on the boat, the net crashed open, all these fish got out. It's a really happy day at that one. But the animators neglected to show you all the injuries and wounding that would have happened as a result of this action, and most of those fish would have been dead in five days. Except for Dory, who came back with another movie a few years ago, so we know she made it. So the exchange issue has been flat just a little bit. Um, certainly was happening in Alaska by uh, Baker and Schindler in a few papers, and they found that up to 44% of spawning replacements, fish on spawning grounds, had injuries reflecting guilt and cancer prior in their life. And up to half of those fish that had those injuries died before spawning. So this is the first real study to really look at this. So we've known that these fish are showing up on spawning grounds with injuries all the time. It's just not really talked about. There were studies that were done in the late 80s and early 90s on Fraser Sauke that showed that in some populations up to 40% of these fish were appearing on spawning grounds in the woods. And even to this day, you can find those on spawning grounds. So we had the opportunity to do uh, an injury assessment as part of an unrelated voluntary study which was the passage through the dam near Lillewet. So here's um, Fraser, here's the St. Louis system and the town of Lillewet right there. The fish migrated 
straight up the freezer. We can turn left at level X. You have to go through it again. You have to go through the to get to the spawn ground that gets free. We just happen to be doing the monitoring right through the dam. So we have a fish that's set up here. And here's the fish wave. Here's the fish wave. Fish wave just come up through the fish wave and off we go. So we're collecting every fish that came up the river in several years of study. And it's just for the fish tank. We were able to categorize wounds. Now, the reason we're categorizing wounds is because we're concerned about the government banging their heads into a grate that was protecting them from coming into the powerhouse because the other train was afraid of them. Uh, so we did this on very few head wounds, but what we did see are lots of gill net wounds. And so you can see uh, how we would score these. So a clean fish with no wounds, some light wounds, moderate wounds, and heavy wounds. And if the condition of the day in and out of at least one, if not the multiple gill at some point earlier in the migration. So on the x axis, the proportion of fish that were net left, and that's what we're looking at with the solid black line. So over the course of three years, add it up across the spawning run, uh, you can see that net marked fish um, are often 20% of the population. And in some cases, 40 or even 60% of the population arriving at our fish tanks. We tagged that fish through that whole period, that's what we're looking at here. So the gray balls are us tagging the fish, shows us three. So we had tags on the fish on different injury levels to see what the effect or the relationship at least between the injury and their ability to continue on their migration. Over half of the migration had days with over 20% of the fish with injury. Most people don't have fish fences sitting on spawning. So most people don't generally look at these fish. Fish that could not have that fish by 200 meters further on would die out and walk back to the fence. The fence is a great accumulator of carcasses. Every carcass that accumulated had gill net marks on it. And here's some examples. Close to every one of those fish has a gill net mark. Here's all the gill net marks. You can see them all. They can open the wounded and check them. So that's one indication that fish that had injuries were unable to complete their migration. So you have these strenuous exercise needed to find the fish where fish can get through. Where are all these gill net injuries coming from? Well, they're coming from down the river at noise level. This is the work that my undergrad Adam Canada did at Cal Master slash PhD school. And what he found was that the probability of a gill net injury uh, was related to the amount of gill net efforts going on. So the higher gill net fishing effort in the lower phrasal, the higher the levels of injury. So there's a really good tale here that the amount of fishing we do in the lower phrasal affects the level of injury. And I'm going to show you in a moment the level of injury affects how well they do on the subsequent migration. So here's the proportion of populations with no injury or with injury uh, in terms of them getting to spawning ground. Are they able to get to the spawning ground? So migration mortality from the fish tank is two times higher for injured fish. But assuming they get to the spawning ground and they die without spawning, how do we tell that? Because we've been looking at tags on the species to see if that's age or not, so we just look at females here. They die on spawning ground without spawning, three times higher for injured fish compared to non-injured fish. So not only is there a migration consequence, but there's a fitness consequence uh, in terms of data spawning ground. But a lot of what we're seeing is occurring quite in between before getting to spawning ground. So what you see spawning ground is not the total story. What happened before that is the story, but very rarely do we get to see that. So if we're going to do something about this, the first thing we have to do is understand why the levels of the rate of mortality associated with a particular type of fishery or handling. And so that's been one of the strengths of what we've done the last 10 years is to be able to quantify this delay of mortality and attribute it to different sorts of handling types. So that's been the first measure, actually, and that's been actually very helpful for uh, DFO and other groups to be able to have that sort of information and to develop an approach for them to be able to use that information in their management models. But also, we hope that we can modify fishing practices to limit this sort of uh, increase in events. So we made all sorts of recommendations into how we can modify fishing practice, hopefully to make things better. And one thing you can do is to reduce the time in net. And by doing that, you're reducing injury and potential escape. How do you reduce the time in net? Well, for a deep spring, you make them shorter. So you don't have to make them shorter. So that means you know, it's, it's more rapid. You can more rapidly be checked. So the fish can come out a little more rapidly if you respect the recovery. We found the first thing is if you keep them looser, but bring them to the boat so tight, fish do not get injured as rapidly or as much. Uh, the other thing you want to do is reduce the time on the boat. So that reduces your injury and impairment. How do you do that? Just make sure you're on that PSP. How do you more rapidly 
short film you wrap it, it's short film by using speed. You can cut them off to the really quickly. Um, and you can expose them to less air. And so with less time, you have to handle more time. They're wet on the boat. And what happens when you have them on the boat, the better they're going to be in terms of air exposure and shit. And in a freshwater context, we just want to not have these high like temperatures and high. Unfortunately, we're going to be getting warmer, and we're going to have to really start to reevaluate whether we're going to allow fishers at all uh, when the river reaches certain temperatures. I know in other jurisdictions, in Eastern Canada and elsewhere, Recovery reciprocation approaches like revival box and ship bags, they have very context specific results. Um, interestingly, the RAP approach we developed could be used to assess the need for use in one of these tools, which it only takes 60 seconds to evaluate a fish in terms of its impairment. And if a fish is only lost or impaired and it's not injured, it would benefit from one of these approaches. If it's significantly impaired or injured, it probably won't. Um, we have helped develop. Management practices, uh, best management practices. This is some work we did on the sea class document that is to derive fish related to channel mortality. We published papers to talk about how much air could be the uh, maximum allowed in different types of fisheries. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up now with which I think is some important context when it comes to what happens to talk about it. So it kind of relates to this presentation. So I'm sure you're all aware of the big bar landslide. Um, there, was, there was a huge chunk of rock. Uh, here in the middle of the Fraser watershed that fell into the river sometime last winter. Um, this is where it came from. You can see it's in the area here, and it created a huge five meter waterfall here. Uh, it impeded the migration of all salmon runs, all the salmon runs uh, during the late spring and early summer. A Herculean effort was mounted by all of the government to try to get fish above that uh, landslide, which generally involved deep sinking fish, just like I talked about earlier, and in this case, I helicoptered them all over the landslide and deposited them upstream. During this helicoptering adventure, there was also a series of monitoring that was going on with radio tagging to look at natural passage as well as the effects of the transportation on these fish. You can see a bird's eye view of what this area looks like, and you can also see a group of probably shipped salmon that either walk through later on their own or drop back from the helicoptering adventure. We know that one third of the runs do not make it through based on the monitoring studies we've done. So a third of these fish perish um, or do not just get to the final house, and a large portion of that would have been early runs and some of the early summer runs. But from a temperature perspective, we got really lucky. So this is the red dot for the actual temperatures experienced this summer. You can see what temperatures have been like in recent years. Um, so temperatures actually were only slightly above average for the first time in a long time, and only eclipsed 19 uh, for a few days. So from a temperature perspective, the high wind that went on probably couldn't have had a better temperature. However, there were still handling effects that we needed to be worried about because of all the extra tagging and extra helicoptering, and we do know that a lot of fish that got transported up dropped back down. And that could be a, a, an effect of the handling, but at least it wasn't any worse than high temperature. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up by thanking a lot of students and postdocs for all the data that they have let me use, and lots of funders and collaborators to thank, and I have some time for questions at this time. Thank you. Yes? I was thinking about one of your recommendations with the uh, recovery boxes. From the, the data that you collected, I mean, we had a 100% loss. Why was that part of your recommendation? Well, it, because they, they were highly impaired based on what we did to them. So, especially in the field study, they were already ca impaired caused by the initial capture event, and then we went and simulated capture again on top of that. And then you're confining the fish to a, uh, a flow by holding them even further. And so, what we're suggesting is that the, uh, these resuscitation approaches can work if the fish is only modestly impaired. So, it ha and, it would, and it, injury will trump a lot of that as well. So that's probably why they haven't been adopted a lot by, by anglers or, or the industries, because they probably don't have the impact that we hope they would have. Yes? Um, it's more like a comment, a different comment. Sure. Uh, we're working with a First Nation, and there's a study on archaeological sites on Burrard Inlet. There's evidence that in before contact, 
the diet of salmon was preferred. The sites have more males than females, uh, so they, the archaeological um, conclusion was that they released females mm. on purpose, which is interesting because it's the only other study you know that has this like female male thing. So there's, it's a good point, and actually within Fraser Sockeye, up until 10 years ago, there were always more males than females. And we've seen now in nine populations that ratio changing over time to the point that we're, we're now close to 50-50 or less than 50-50 in milk. Um, now more in favor of um, more in favor of uh, males. So sorry, it was always always um, more dominated by the. It was always more dominated by females initially. Mm -hmm. That ratio has been declining now to almost 50-50, but it was significantly more females on spawning grounds, in, in which it, which is why DFO and other agencies have never cared about this phenomenon of declining female survivorship because it didn't matter um, the, over the last decade because even a 50-50 ratio they felt was good. The smolts leave at 50-50 in all the studies that have been done. So something's going on in the ocean in terms of male mortality leading to higher levels of females generally coming back, at least in Sokka. Um, so what we're suggesting is that in the last 15 to 20 years where we're starting to see higher female mortality, that that's contributing to the more even ratio now on spawning grounds. It wasn't an even ratio in the past. The, we also see this now with Chinook and Kobo in terms of their ability to respond to stressors, but we have no idea what they look like on spawning grounds because the data just don't look at sex very often. And it's interesting to look at the, the um, archaeological information because very few people have gone back in time to look at sex ratios. And it would be interesting to, I'd be interested to learn more about that. Okay. Um, hold on, at the back. The, um, the high mortality you find for released salmon, um, how has that been dealt with in the sort of management modeling in the past? And are they going to be incorporating the apparent higher mortality rates that you guys have found? Yeah, so in the past, the, there were best guesstimates used on what the mortality, late mortality rates would be. And um, they would incorporate that into their models in, sort of, uh, to, in terms of predicting what escapement levels might end up being. And they were, generally, the levels were quite low. And they were low because agencies tended to use these 24-hour holding studies, which bias things low. Um, what we've developed for them is a process for now incorporating that information into management models and, and how do you use that science. I still haven't seen a lot of change yet, uh, although the recreational Marine Chinook and Coho fisheries are jumping on this now, uh, and they're they're going to be they have now higher levels like 20 maybe 25 percent uh, expected mortality of released fish, and that's something we're going to be looking at ourselves with the telemetry studies starting this year. But it's it's not gotten into the system yet, but the process is there for them to use that data. Yeah. So. If you have a fish that experiences hypoxia, and I guess it gets high uh, blood lactate and acid blood, but it's not handled and it's not injured, but it recovers on its own, but it still has that delayed mortality in the day or two, what's causing that? Heart attack. So is that known? Is yeah. That, is that yeah, yeah we, we've looked at it. It's called EPOC, excess post oxygen consumption. And so we've looked at this uh, in, with other studies, and um, females are more prone to that as well because they have smaller hearts um, and gonads that are sucking oxygen uh, from their other tissues. So what happens is they can't, they cannot supply enough oxygen to their brains or other tissues. But it, it, that's, it's a process that occurs over days, and so you'll find most mortality associated with with impairment that's not a physical injury is usually occurring within three to five days. Okay, and it's because the heart is by the acidosis? Uh, well, that's a contributing factor, but it's just that they, can, they cannot get enough oxygen to feed the brain and other organs. Right, but that happens afterwards as a consequence of damage to the heart. Well, it's not necessarily damage to the heart, it's just it's, it's, incapable of, okay. it's incapable of pushing enough oxygen to the organs. Okay. Because it's repaying an oxygen debt that's huge. Yeah, thank you very much.